Hello and welcome to episode 16 of Into the Spotlight. I'm Ryan. And I'm Morley. Our guest today is a designer, maker, restorer, and reimaginer. You might have seen her on Instagram as Sweet City Woman, where recently she's been making incredible miniatures, a lot of them featuring quintessential vintage furniture. You might have also seen her as the founder of Hollis Newton, where she reimagines vintage and antique furniture into one-off bespoke pieces. As you can tell, we have a lot to talk about this episode. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Roxanne Brathwaite. Roxanne, thank you so much for coming on and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful. So yeah, like, of course, when um, Andy Pugh, who's been on the show before, introduced me to your page and um, the the moment I saw it, I was like, this is a creative person who we really have to have on at some point. And I'm so happy we're finally doing it. Oh, um, you. you do like so much cool stuff. So I would just love first to hear sort of like your background and your story and how life led you to the creative pursuits that you're doing right now. Sure. So I would have to probably go back to my childhood. I always loved furniture, uh, starting with my dollhouse. You know, I, I kind of threw out all the dolls and just focused on the furniture. I just, I just loved it. And I made a lot of my own furniture for the houses. Um, uh, university, I studied uh, art history. I didn't really know where that would lead me. Uh, I just know that my parents wanted me to go to university and get a degree. So that's what I did. Uh, one of my first jobs was working in the fashion industry. And what that introduced me to was a whole um, group of people that were creative, you know, and I thought, okay, this is my tribe. I, I really want to be a part of this. So I actually ended up going back to school and I studied graphic design and I'm still doing that to this day. Um, but in the background, I was always still loving the furniture and restoring furniture. Um, and uh, I, I, I wanted to do, I thought upholstery would be something cool to do. And I looked for institutions that were teaching it and only to find out it was kind of a, a dying trade, you know, nobody was teaching it anymore. And I also looked around to, um, you know, people that were teaching upholstery, um, doing upholstery as a business. And I thought, okay, maybe I can get, uh, be an apprentice. And so I approached a couple of them and I just didn't get a response from them. So one day I, I came across this young lady um, and her dad and her stepmom um, ran this upholstery shop. And I just wandered in one day and I said, hey, would you take on, take me on as an apprentice? And uh, they did. They were happy to. And that was in 2014. And I was doing that up until the COVID lockdown. <laughs> and uh, then from because I was at home and um, on the weekends, uh, I thought, oh, you know, what am I going to do with myself? So that's when I actually started doing the miniatures and they've just been so popular. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's been a, a great pivot for me. So before before you had dived back into miniatures recently, had you done any miniature work like since a kid with your dollhouse? None whatsoever. Wow. You know, I think just before the COVID lockdown, I came across an artist that was doing miniatures and they were placing them in shelves and just really unconventional places. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, I can do that. I don't need like a big dollhouse or anything like that. And I have shelves here. I could just put it in shelves. So I just started doing a few pieces and I showed my uh, some friends and they loved it. And I just kept going and I just started doing them. And, you know, to tell you the truth, I was I was I wasn't even going to put them on social media. I just thought, mm, I don't know if it's a good fit, but uh, I'm glad I did because <laughs> it just kind of took off from there. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I never before my after my childhood, I never really touched it again. 
And what when inspired you again as during the COVID lockdowns to kind of come back and revisit this in this new way, especially after all the experiences that you've had, what brought you back to it? Well, I, I think time. <laughs> I just had some time on my hand, you know. Uh, since 2014, on the weekends, I would be in the upholstery shop, you know, working on that trade. So with the lockdown, uh, I had all this time and I still wanted to work with furniture. I still wanted to be creative and productive. So it just seemed like a, a natural fit now that I look back, <laughs> you know, at the time. I, I wasn't really thinking about it that way, but you know, now that I look back, I think, oh, yeah, of course, <laughs> miniatures, <laughs> Right. you know, so it, it just seems like a, a, a really good thing that I did. Yeah, it sort of became like a microcosm of everything that you couldn't do outside that you could do inside then, like as local. Exactly. As it was it was a total downsize, you know, <laughs> literally, I, I was still working with furniture, but just I just downscaled it, you know, so. Yeah. That's incredible. When I first saw it, like um, on your blog, I thought it was like uh, before we were doing research before the interview. I was thinking, uh, when I first saw the photo, I thought like, oh, she does interior design. It was only until I actually looked at it more. I was like, oh my god, these are actually miniatures. It's so impressive. And you see the hand just yeah, just subtly in the corner. Exactly. It's so impressive, especially like just the details, like in the smaller objects, like in the book covers and everything. That's amazing how you're able to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, it, it's. Uh... I, I've, I knew nothing about the miniature world before, before uh, COVID lockdown. Really? And uh, yeah, and now I'm just totally immersed in it. And there's so many great artists out there. And some of them are, are you know, they just do one thing really well. And uh, if it's something that I want to learn, you know, I, I just go to that person that knows that, that does that one thing really well. And I, I just try to, you know, learn from, from them. Um, but uh, I just try to make everything. I know, uh, you know, some collectors and makers, uh, they collect from other makers and stuff, but I, um, I'm trying to stick with doing everything. So I'll paint the pictures, I'll do the weaving, I'll build the furniture, fireplaces, staircases, anything. Um, I'll put my hands on it. So, uh, so and, and I also, you know, trying to keep with the, um, the vintage feel of things you know I've always loved vintage furniture so um, with this downsize I definitely do the same yeah that's that's something I noticed I think right off the bat with your miniatures is um, the sort of like homage you play to like famous pieces I, I'm I know a little bit about a furniture my knowledge doesn't go much deeper than like Eames and Herman Miller um, mm -hmm. my ones. my grand my grandparents growing up had like in Eames lounge chair. And I always oh, thought it was like the nice. coolest thing in the world. I, mean, I, I want one eventually one day, Oh, for um, sure. but it's, it's so cool how you're able to kind of like draw that into the miniatures. And I think that that's really interesting as well, how in doing everything in the miniatures, because I think it's also a good way to sort of like have a consistent aesthetic. Cause if, if you start taking in like other construction methods, like if someone's doing something with casting or, or a method that you're not using, it could look a little a little less cohesive. And I think that's something that's really cool about your work is like, it's a very self-contained little world that looks like it was all built to go together. Yeah, thanks. Um, I When I did my first um, installation, what I was really trying to do is replicate my own living room. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cool. It, it was just too ambitious. I just, I didn't have the skill set at that point, you know? And so I, I think I captured that style and I've just kind of kept that style going. You know, I, I surround myself with a lot of plants and, and art and books, and I always bring them into m my miniature spaces. So um, I think that's why everything kind of looks cohesive and looks like it goes together. So um, if I, I kind of feel if I could live in that little space, you know, it's something that I would like to live in. So, uh, yeah, it, it just, uh, has that certain look to it. Right. And it's amazing, like how you're able to put that together, because like you mentioned by doing all your stuff, it's totally your vision that you're able to create the space in the way that you see it, you know, not saying, you know, cause other people's work's amazing, but you want to be able to develop it in the way that you see it and bring it to life that way. 
Like, that's why I'm a big fan of, like, period pieces, like, you know, films and TV shows, because you're like, you can appreciate that bringing back all these old styles and you can actually see them and live through them even just momentarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think also uh, my background in in marketing, too, (laughs) you know, uh, just the idea of having this branded cohesive look, um, that definitely probably plays a part in everything that I do also, so... Um, yeah, I definitely am influenced by the whole marketing part of it. Yeah. And where does um, your, because you mentioned your passion for antiques and vintage furniture, where does that, where does that come from? Well, I've always had a love for well-made and well-designed things. And, you know, when it comes to vintage furniture and antiques, I think just by the virtue of them still being around, you just know that they're really built well. They have really good bones, you know, Mm -hmm. built solid wood and, you know, really built to last. So I've always loved that, um, that idea of, uh, you know, well-designed, well-built things. And, you know, it, it really, it always saddened me to see, um, you know, the newer imported stuff that was made by, um, you know, press wood and synthetic materials. And and then you just see it at the side of the road sometimes on garbage day. And it just seems so disposable. And I just thought, I, I just can't do that. I, I, I want, you know, all generations to really embrace um, vintage and, and antiques. And I realize that younger people don't you know, really like antiques. A lot of them don't, you know, it reminds them of a, you know, musty, dusty kind of parlor <laughs> that their grandmother would have dated in, you know, or received her, her, you know, um, or met your grandfather in or something, you know. <laughs> so um, I thought, okay, I, I, I definitely can update them, you know, just give it a, a fresher look. Um, I know that there were upholsters and designers that were, just maybe doing it with fabric, you know, maybe choosing a, a a different updated kind of fabric. But I, I just thought you could push it a little bit further. So, um, I just the shop that I work out of, um, you know, they they specialize in leather, and um, I thought, okay, leather is something that lasts forever if you take good care of it. Uh, let me incorporate that material, the leather, with these vintage pieces. It automatically updates it and it gives it some longevity and, um, you know, um, it, it, it will, it will automatically just make it contemporary and, um, and last for, you know, the style will last forever. Uh, it's not something that's trendy, you know, hopefully 20, 50 years is still relevant. We were talking, um, in the, in our like conversation before this, um, in your sort of adventures, finding vintage furniture and some of the crazy things you'll find mixed into the bones of these pieces. Um, I'd love to hear some, some stories about that. Um, the things you find buried in a couch. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, we definitely find a lot of, uh, coins <laughs> and, uh, and some jewelry sometimes, um, you know, toys, <laughs> all kinds of things. Um, but uh, what always fascinates me with, uh, you know, when we strip furniture down to the bare bones, um, how for, you, you get to see how furniture is made. Mm. And sometimes, you know, especially with the newer stuff, you know, it's just amazing how people are even able to sit on it because, you know, a little bit of moisture or anything gets into pressed wood and you know what it does, mm. right? It just kind of expands and it just weakens the wood. So. A couple of, of, of pieces have come into the shop and, the, and they're just barely held together. <laughs> you know, they're, um, one had like, you know, a hockey stick and um, a belt and I, I think a pot holder and uh, <laughs> maybe a tennis racket. I don't know. It was just so crazy. But uh, we get a good laugh sometimes at uh, some of the things that we find when we open up a couch. So, uh, yeah, it's quite funny, actually. So, Is, Are there like specific characteristics you can point to in good not maybe not even vintage but in good quality furniture that allows it to last or is a big part of it as well like 
the design itself and then how much people will care about it and pass it down? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, I think, uh, both of those can come into play. Um, definitely the construction and the materials that go into uh, a piece of material, uh, a piece of furniture rather will determine, uh, how long it will last. Um, so, you know, sustainable um, materials like wood, definitely, you definitely want that in your, your couch. Sometimes it's hard to tell, right? You can't, you know, don't go into the showroom and, and tear apart, a, tear apart a, uh, a piece of furniture, but uh, sometimes a giveaway is just where it was made, you know, and, and the price point and where you're buying it. So if you're buying it from a, a big box store, usually, no, it's not going to be well made. <laughs> Um, and it's probably imported from overseas. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I would, I would definitely caution people against, uh, the word leather, uh, when you see it in a, um, in advertised, uh, in the description, because a lot of leather is not leather, you know, and I'm actually trying to talk to maybe my MPP or, um, uh, somebody in government to try and, legislate the use of the word leather and in, in buying um and buying leather products because i think a lot of uh consumers are getting duped and uh, they think they're buying leather and then you know a rip appears a month or so maybe a year and then it's on the side of the road so um definitely materials will determine if something's going to last um as far as design you know it it's hard to say because things come in and out of fashion. Um, I always say good design is timeless, but um, who's to say? You know, it's so sub subjective. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, design and, and materials are probably will determine uh, the longevity of a piece. Yeah, that, that's a. I, I think that's a good point that like design really is so subjective. And I think I was listening to a podcast recently and they were answering a question of like, do you have any artistic movements or styles that you don't like in, in this mm -hmm. context of building furniture? And they were saying like, no, I mean like every period, like shaker furniture, modern furniture, mm -hmm. postmodern, contemporary, like there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. It's like yeah. people, people say like, oh, music today is terrible. Well, mm -hmm. there was a lot of terrible music back in the day as well. It's just the good stuff <laughs> right, lasts and rises to the top in the same way as furniture does. Absolutely. That's yeah. so true. Mm -hmm. But it is funny sometimes as well to see the, the not so great stuff that um, leaks through the cracks. And I think, and I think in, in you can, that's one of the hallmarks I find of like good period shows and pieces is when they show the like the awkward phases of design like i was watching the queen's gambit <laughs> and um just the interior of the house they live in with all like the awkward like curtains in the middle of the right. room for no reason and moldings okay. and you're like oh <laughs> like right. so much wallpaper <laughs> sure it's right it you know yeah and you say that and i wonder what the next um phase will bring you know i think we're seeing a lot of people spending a lot of time at home so they're they're, I think they're kind of doing like a little bit of an inventory and kind of questioning what is really important and what they need and how, what their comfort level is. And, and uh, I, I don't know how that's going to change. You know, we definitely seen the shift towards buying local and, um, you know, questioning um, our waste, you know, how much, uh, how much we're wasting things and our, our, our carbon footprint and all that. So, you know, I think that's all going to go into the next kind of phase of design, uh, the next generation. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. Definitely. And just going on that point where we're talking about subjectivity, because on the website for Hollis Newton, you uh, describe how you, when you comes to making furniture, about taking something that's an antique and vintage and reimagining reimagining that in your own vision. What's that creative process like for you? Well, the creative process. Um, as best as, or as, like, as best, yeah. yeah, as best as I can describe it. Um, you know, 
the first thing I, I have to identify is something with good bones that I think has value and is timeless uh, or I can make it timeless. So I would start with that. So something that is, uh, that has good bones. And then I would, um, sometimes I just, I, I'll just store it for a, a bit. I wouldn't even touch it or go, you know, I have a couple pieces that are just stripped down and, and it's only when I come across a, you know, an idea that I want to use on that piece in particular, that I'll drag it out and work on it. Right. So, um, so that can take like, sometimes the ideas come immediately. Sometimes it takes months or more, you know, and, uh, but I always have this idea that the furniture almost tells me what it, <laughs> it needs to be done. <laughs> you know, it just, uh, it just seems like a good fit when the idea, it's almost like a puzzle piece fitting together. Like when the, the idea comes about and then I have that right piece and it just kind of snaps together. And, uh, and then I just start uh, working, th working through it. Now with those things, you know, I don't really do sketches or anything like that. I just start pulling together materials and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, leather hides in the shop. So I'll just sometimes take them, you know, just take a swatch out of them and, and just, you know, um, put a couple of them together, see how they look. And um, if I need to start shopping for other materials, I'll do that at that point. And, uh, and it just kind of comes together, you know, um, usually I have an idea where I want it to go. So, um, I will, I will just keep working and massaging it and noodling it until it gets there. Hmm. So, yeah. um, piece by piece, basically. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, so. it's funny how, like, as, as all of us as creators, as creative types, you know, the way timing plays such a role in how we get our projects made, whether it's like you're designing a piece of furniture or for me, whether it's like making a short film or writing, writing a, sh a short film, or even with Morley with his videos, how he designs his projects, like how timing, because sometimes I can get an idea, then you kind of get stuck with it for a while, then you just kind of like put it away. And after a while, it comes mm -hmm. back to you after you've had some experiences, and then it just all clicks together. It's always such a cathartic moment when that happens. Ah, for sure. Now it's funny with the smaller pieces, with the miniature pieces, I cycle through that really quickly. Um, but it's, it's almost more processes, you know, I, I, I add a, a sketching phase in there and, uh, you know, I'll go probably on, on, um, you know, on the internet and just do some researching on the piece. And, and, uh, then I do a technical drawing and then I cut it, um, either manually or with, uh, the laser cutter. And, uh, and even then I, I do some alterations, um, until I get it to where I want. And, uh, yeah, I think there's more steps with the smaller pieces than the bigger pieces, interestingly enough. So, okay. yeah. Because you have to be like so precise and so meticulous and detailed with it. I, I guess that's it. I mean, I would, I would guess if I was just coming from the outside that the bigger pieces would have more steps, but, uh. Yeah, no, the little, the little, maybe it's the, the, the details. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, it definitely takes me more, definitely more steps. Right. And more mistakes, <laughs> I think. <also. laughs> well, that's part of the fun. So, exactly. Yeah. It sure is. So, um, yeah, they never see the light of Instagram <laughs> mistakes, <laughs> but, but they're fun and they're learning experiences. So you, you talked about um, in the, doing some of the research for the miniatures, um, I'm curious to know like how the scenes themselves sort of come about and if you've ever tried to replicate like a photograph or you more combine aspects from different pieces themselves and try to bring it all together into one scene. Yes. Lately I've been doing that. I'll um, just make a whole uh, bunch of, um, you know, accessories and I don't always know where they're going. Um, but once I start making the bigger pieces and actually putting a room together, then I'll start bringing in some of the accessories. Sometimes I'll do accessories specific for that uh, space, but, um, but usually it's just pulling together different accessories that I made. Now I, 
I might be doing, um, I spoke to a, um, a curator uh, not too long ago, and I might be doing a, a room that is more of a, I guess, a, a room from the 70s. And it would be, well, uh, let me just back up a bit. So this curator had uh, inherited about 200 photographs from his, from his grandfather. Um, and his grandfather was an immigrant from uh, the Caribbean. And so he came to Canada, I think, in the 70s. And there was something very common about every Caribbean home. You know, it had all this, all these kind of, um, you know, just um, just things that reminded them of their home island. So if you came into the, the home, you would automatically know what island they're from, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So I was talking with him and uh, he's thinking of doing, uh, you know, some kind of, um, of uh, show. And I told him my idea for it, for it. So we might be doing, I might be doing um, a 70s room uh, of this Caribbean uh, Canadian experience. So that would kind of be the first time I do something like that where I'm, you know, making things specifically uh, all for that room. Now, f for the piece that I'm working on now, which is for Design TO, um, there's a little bit more of that, but I am taking stuff from things that I've made before. So I've made things specifically for these rooms, but I'm also pulling from other things that I made earlier, not specifically for this. That's so cool. I, I there's there's so much magic, um, especially as a kid. Like I would always love going whenever there's a museum and there's a miniature recreation of something, and you see it. It is so incredible. I was at um, so random, like the Virginia Museum of Transportation, which may wow, not sound okay. like the coolest thing in the world, but it is an incredible <laughs> museum. Have you been there? No, I have it, but it sounds incredible. I want to go. Oh, no, it is. So they have, they have like all, they have a whole train yard full of trains from like the late 1800s to modern day, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then they have all these vintage cars and then they have movie cars and then they have smaller exhibits as well. And one of the smaller exhibits is a um, miniature recreation of the Barnum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth circus. Oh, wow. And yeah. it is, pro the table is probably... 10 feet by no probably like 15 feet by six feet um and it was like someone spent a decade on this like wow. on the weekends amazing and, um, yeah it, it's cool because like it's it's things that you normally can never see things that you can't really see from that perspective ever once they are miniaturized you feel like you can really like peek in all these little spots and right right see it as a whole yeah. You know, I think miniature is just something that actually ties us all together. I mean, as a kid, we all made, you know, created a miniature world, you know, whether it's yeah. the small cars or trains or dollhouses or Legos, we all created miniature worlds. So I think it kind of speaks to, you know, something in all of us when we see miniature stuff, you know, we just kind of relate and kind of go back to our childhood a little bit. Yeah. Also, I think also as well of like um, the Japanese, I can't remember what they're called, but the small like um, little temples that people put in their yards. Okay, um, right. Gardens. You're right. I mean, they're, they're, they're in every culture. They're mm -hmm. in, in every form as well. Like kids sure. are building forts for their little G.I. Joes and people are building like religious shrines in miniature. They're everywhere. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It really helps us make sense of our world because but it allows us to shrink it, but also expand it at the same time because it allows us to kind of grow and being able to create these spaces. Maybe not so much now because it's all done through computers and creative software, right. but think back back for even like urban planning or even like, you know, like the old uh, blockbuster films from the 50s and 60s where they all use miniatures, for example. And how, right. exactly and you know how it played such a big role in our imaginations like you know if i could i could watch like an old uh you know sci-fi movie from the 1950s like war of the worlds for example i don't care if i can see like the strings you know piloting the ships you can still appreciate it you know the fact that they would build this entire set whereas now right, it'll be all right. digitized and even though like it's still impressive visually it doesn't have the same sort of 
tactile sort of um, hand craftsmanship that that we don't see as much as as much as, as we should today. Right. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that being said, though, there is some incredible stop motion artists mm-hmm. uh, right now making the the coolest films. I mean, like, oh, yeah. I, I feel like Coraline just ah, stuck with me totally. so much and, and just how much it's able to represent like a dreamlike state. Right. Um, like I've had dreams that felt exactly like Coraline <laughs> oh, wow. and it's, and it's creepy, um, but it's so, it's just so well done. And I think part of it, like you said, Ryan is that fact that they are creating the physical world. So it feels more accessible to you. And part of you can like tell that it's, it's all real in a certain extent, even though it's fictionalized, it can sort of exist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. I don't know, like you mentioned, it's funny that you mentioned morally about trains before, because when I was a young kid, like four or five, six, you know, used to play with like the Thomas the Tank Engine sets. And, you know, it would come with like these little miniatures with like the wooden rails. And like, I would transform my basement just over here into like this massive sort of city full of like inter- interconnected wooden, wooden trains and railways. But it's just, I guess it's just a way for us to just be able to create in a way that's just so just utilizing our imagination to the fullest that's something really special yeah, yeah. for me and it was this... it was all lego and, and playmobil to a certain extent oh, yeah. but playmobil is i mean i would make like little cut out pieces of uh blue cloth to make ponds and things oh, nice. but most of the playmobil okay. stuff is already made but lego <laughs> you can really run wild i would just turn everything into a car so it would be like, okay. I just <laughs> want to put it on wheels. It's just right, this, right. I don't know what that says about my psychology, but I just wanted to be able to move everything around. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. You you mentioned, um, Roxanne, the design TO experience. Um, I, I'm curious to know like what exactly that project is. Um, I think as well outside of Toronto, people might not know exactly like what that organization is or what the work might be like. Sure. So DesignTO is, uh, I think it's one of Canada's largest um, uh, exhibits, art exhibits. Uh, And it takes place across the city. Uh, Different artists exhibit um, in galleries and um, talks and window displays. And, you know, because of COVID, uh, it's been, I guess, truncated a little bit. Um, So no, you know, in gallery visits. Um, but it's moved online, but the window displays are still on. So that's what I'll be doing. I'm doing three window displays, uh, three miniature um, miniature installations in a window display, and they're, I'm addressing three uh, social issues that have been impacted by COVID. So one is... Um, uh, intimate partner abuse, domestic violence. Uh, the other is um, law enforcement interaction with people uh, suffering with mental health issues. And the third one is uh, child abuse. So those are just three issues that uh, have been on the increase since right. uh, the um, pandemic t- pandemic lockdown. So um, I just thought it was a good medium um to introduce or um, raise um, awareness about those issues um i just love the way that people um approach and accept uh miniatures and i just thought okay this is this is a good this is a good medium to work with you know um uh yeah uh, i'll i'll just see how it goes <laughs> you know uh it, it's 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 something new to me, um, but I, I just like I like the idea of using um, raising awareness um, of social issues through art. Right. You know, um, yeah, it's something totally new, but uh, it feels good. It feels good to me. It's like you mentioned, raising awareness is so significant, especially with all of the social issues that we have witnessed in the past year and well before that. In your experience, what has it been like to express these issues through your art and the space that you create in? Yeah, well, the first time I did that was um, with uh, the um, suite installation number two. So at the time, I think I had just finished my first 
piece for the second installation and the Black Lives Matter protest broke out. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like it was a way for me to cope and just kind of move through that time. And what I did was I actually did three portraits of uh, one was uh, George Floyd, uh, the other one's Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. And it, it was just like I, I mentioned, a, a way to cope. And it, it, I, I just felt like I just didn't want to make beautiful um, pieces without carrying some kind of message in them. Mm-hmm. I thought I got people's attention. Let me just say something, you know. Uh, it was just, just a a very, very difficult time, yeah. and it just felt. I just felt like that was something that that I had to do. Um, so when this um, exhibit came up, I thought, you know, I can do this again. I can bring awareness to other issues. So let me try and do that. You know, um, I think, as I mentioned, uh, miniatures are just something that's just easy on the eyes. You know, it's kind of hard to look away. And I think in particular with these social issues, sometimes we do look away and that's the problem, right? Mm. So um, you, I capture people's attention and um, they have to look, you know, they, they look, they want to look. Um, and it's kind of almost like a metaphor for these social issues too, because, you know, you can drive by a beautiful house and have, you know, look in a magazine and has beautiful furniture, but you really don't know what's going on behind those doors and what's going on in that family, you know, something mm-hmm. really um, unspeakable or, or, or um, you know, terrible could be going on. So it's just kind of a metaphor to look, to look a little bit closer, you know, look at your neighbor and look at, you know, look for signs, look at the, the, the kids that are, um, you know, in your, in your, in your neighborhood. Yeah. Especially um, now where those kids might not have another place to go. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, teachers are often the frontline uh, people that report um, child abuse. So how do you, how do they do that now through Zoom calls? Right. Um, I just heard, I think last week, that a lot of kids turn off the video when they're on the Zoom calls. Mm-hmm. So um, it's quite difficult. You know, the parents are stressed and, you know, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a terrible situation. So, mm-hmm. and, um, and, you know, it's, it's, again, it's, it's a way of working through those issues for myself, because when I, when it, the, the, the lockdown originally happened, it was a conversation that I had with a friend of mine, and we were talking about all the crimes that would increase or decrease with COVID. And those were some of the ones that we identified. And I immediately just felt really sad about the whole, the whole yeah. issue. Yeah. And it made me think about uh, the crime crimes that had happened in Toronto that were high profile, you know, that I never forgot, you know, um, for the, in the domestic violence one, um, actually one of my good friends, um, her sister was killed. Uh, by her, her domestic partner, so I included her in in the um, installation number one that addresses uh, that raises awareness of domestic violence. And um, yeah, it just uh, it just it just made me quite sad. But okay. I did want to I did want to remember those people that were that were you know killed that way um, in all three of the. The installations that I'm doing. So, I a few years ago in when I was living in Montreal, I went to an exhibition by Kent Monkman, who's a Canadian First Nations artist, um, and like incredibly, incredibly vibrant paintings and dioramas and sculptures, um, and he'll do these sort of like retrospective paintings where it's a historical 
Canadian scene, but then there'll be, you look in the corner of the painting and it's something else is going on and it, it, no. and you don't really notice it at first, but it's right. a lot of it is comments on um, the Canadians treatments of first nations people. Right. Um, and colonialism. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and it's, I think what you said earlier about like it, like art as a way of like reaching people about these issues in a way that other things can't because like me at like at that point in time like this wasn't necessarily something i was searching for but like the art was so incredible and like i couldn't help but follow the stories and then it made me sort of like turn around and notice like like all the first nations homeless people on the street and like it it makes you and like art has that impact in a way that a lot of things don't where it like it can affect you so strongly in ways that you can't explain where you, you have, you like have no choice, but to consider it. Um, right. And it sticks with you in a way that a lot of things won't. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm definitely trying to, to capture, to capture that or some of that, you know, I, I, I don't know how it will go. It would be great to hear some of the feedback, but uh, um, yeah, I'm going to try it. Give it a try. There is one, there is, this is a bit of a change of gears, but um, I, I feel remiss if we didn't at least mention it, but one thing that I came across um, in looking through your website is a term you call lacache. And I think it's great. And I love original words. So if you wouldn't mind, what is lacache and what does it mean? Right. So lacache is a, an acronym and it stands for Local economy, craftspeople, artists, and secondhand economy. So when I was originally, you know, trying to put a blog together, I thought of building a community of, um, you know, just like-minded folks. And I just kind of looked at my life and how I was living and what was important to me. And it was always about, you know, supporting local the you know local economy and supporting artists and craftspeople and the secondhand economy and I thought you can live your life this way and create um, you know incredibly creative spaces um, will save you money it's good for the planet it's good for your wallet <laughs> so that's how it it all started um, and definitely one of my my I guess heroines in the whole thing was uh that probably started it all was um Jane Jacobs um I don't know if you heard of her but she was quite quite instrumental in in um city planning in Toronto she was actually American but she moved to Toronto and she was really uh, a great advocate for um building strong neighborhoods and I I really tied that into to, to how I wanted to live my life. And, and I just thought that it tied in also well with the brand that I was building for Sweet City Woman and also for Hollis Newton. So I just built that. And, um, you know, I, I found that a lot of people were embracing that, you know, they had been living like that for, for a long time. So I just thought, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a good, good thing that I wanted to build. It is. It's so funny. Like thinking of how you describe it, like it it reminds me so much of my group of friends in university. Um, And I feel like we were like living a Lakashi lifestyle together. Like we had this great community. We would have, I I grew up with a, not grew up. (laughs) I went to university with a bunch of people where in our first year, we didn't go to a traditional dorm. We all were like in an apartment style residence. So we all had to like learn how to cook together. And that sort of informed a lot of the rest of our university experience. So throughout the rest of it, like we had a lot of potlucks, we would trade furniture a lot. We would, everyone, a lot of people were really into making things like knitting and embroidery. And for me, like woodworking and, and all these other things. Um, And it's, I sort of miss it now. Like, I think I, I think like a lot of people, like I took it for granted in university. Like you have this sort of art, not even artificial, but you have this community that is can be really awesome and once you go out into like the post-university world like you have to work really hard to build that up again um but yeah like they're like people making like macrame and i don't know it's 
it's a great life. And um, I think in an increasingly digital world, especially now where people are like craving social contact, it's it's going to become increasingly important. Yeah, I think so. I think also with COVID, you're seeing um, a return to buying and supporting local. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see that. Um, and also, you know, buying from local artists and artisans and um, and supporting the secondhand economy. Um, I'm liking all of it. I just think it, it's great. It's always been here, but um, the you know the wider it, it, it expands, it, it's great. That's one thing I always loved when because I'm from a small town. So when I first moved to the city from Montreal and then Toronto for university, I always it was such an eye opening experience going to these areas like the Plateau area, in Montreal, or in Kensington Market in Toronto, or in the beaches in Toronto, and being able to see all these little little boutiques or shops or creative enterprises well not enterprises but like businesses small businesses or people just being able to have these little communities where they're supporting each other like i know in the beaches they have their jazz festival in the summer and seeing how it's like even despite being these massive metropolises there's still that sense of community in these areas where creatives can still support each other and it's uh just i would love to see so much more of that just so much more spread out and like you mentioned i think Hopefully, COVID makes people kind of appreciate what's who's around them, what's around them to appreciate people's talents and abilities, and maybe just so we could all just, like you like you mentioned, being able to build stronger bonds in the community that way. That's something I would love to see. Yeah, it would be great. I I really hope that um, you know we remember everything that we're going through right now, yes. and we carry some of those good habits forward because I think it will be it will be great. You know, as we rebuild. Um, that we carry these uh, principles forward. Yeah. I think it will be hard not to. I think like six months ago, it seemed at least to me like this could be a quick flip and then a switch back to normalcy. But I think coming up on a year of like fundamentally altered life, I can't really see any other way than like things are, people are going to remember this a lot and it's going to have some like long ranging impacts. Yeah. I don't know. I just really, I can't really see any other eventuality no i agree with that i mean people are are like fish they usually have short memories <laughs> it's kind of like dory and finding nemo <laughs> but now now i think because like this is like impacting the whole world i mean it's just just to consider that this is impacting everyone's way of life so i think it's just giving a lot of people time to just really you know it's not gonna be over tomorrow that's for sure but i just think it's just the um ripple effects is just gonna impact the way we see the world and just just the way we see each other and our neighbors and, you know, our local businesses and hopefully value valuing them a lot more. I hope so. I hope that, I hope you're right. (laughs) (laughs) We'll check in on this in about five years time. Yes. (laughs) Hopefully things will be normal by then. Yes. (laughs) So Roxanne, I, I have a lot of friends in the, in the maker community as we like to call it. And, People do all sorts of stuff. A lot of people do woodworking, 3D printing, leatherworking, but I don't really know many people who do upholstery or who like redo furniture. So I know you sort of got into the route through an apprenticeship, but I was wondering like if someone came to you and they wanted to get into upholstery or taking a old piece of furniture and refinishing and, and like breathing new life into it, um, if you had any tips for how to go about like getting started in that or like really basic tools or like you just need to start at this level before you can do anything. Um, right. If yeah, you had anything um, you could impress. Sure. Um, I, I did, I did uh, write a, a blog article with um, just the tools. Um, and I, I think I broke it down into, um, you know, must haves, nice to haves. And, um, there was another already haves, I think. So upholstery projects that you can, um, and this was under the assumption, if you're going to attack upholstery, it, it, I'm assuming this is not your first do it yourself job (laughs) because it's not (laughs) something for, it's not an entry level, uh, do it yourself or (laughs) thing. So, um, there's tools that you probably already have that could lend themselves to upholstery. 
So there are some specific tools that you need. Um, and um, the first uh, from that list would probably be a staple remover, especially if you're, you know, removing old, old uh, upholstery um, from a piece. Um, you want to make sure that you're not, um, you know, affecting the, the wood frame. So there's this tool with kind of a forked edge that you want to just lift up the, the uh, staples from. So um, there's plenty of great tutorials online. <laughs> you know, I, I don't do any of that, <laughs> but uh, there's there, uh, you know, I, I'd recommend that, you know, you just look at a couple of those. And um, there's definitely some entry level uh, um, jobs for uh, a pull that you can do. Um, like the wrap over, like the, maybe for your um, dining room chair, you know, that's probably a wrap over that uh, can easily be done um, at your home, you know, uh, something like an armchair, probably not, I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, you, you, there's a couple steps that you need probably before you can tackle something like that, but uh, just some simple dining room chairs and things like that. I think once you have the right tools, um, the staple re remover, as I mentioned, and then you need um, uh, a staple gun. Um, and I think with those tools, I think you could pretty much uh, do those jobs pretty easily. Cool. It's, it's, it's funny because like I do a good amount of leather working, but like leather working in and of itself is like such a massive world. So I've never even like thought about touching furniture. I've done like notebook covers and wallets and belts mm -hmm. and things like that. But um, I know that there's plenty of leather workers who only do furniture and they don't right. do any, or, or they only do saddles or something right. else. Like it can become so specified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great material to work with. Um, you know, when, when you, when you, looking at upholstery uh, with leather, it's a totally different grade or, um, you know, uh, you know, you have the top, your top and your full hide, and then you just keep going down from there. Um, so for upholstery, it's usually uh, top or full grain that you use. And that just gives you a little bit, it's a little softer and it allows it to fold a little bit better over, mm. uh, like it would give you a nice soft edge. Um, I would think that you're using a, maybe a little bit, uh, the thicker, thicker hide. So you need a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. I, 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 I have a beautiful roll of some nine ounce of edge tan leather that would oh, definitely nice. not okay. fold over furniture very well. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's really tough and durable, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Better for boots and things. Exactly. Exactly. I know exactly what you're, you're talking about and they make good bags too. <laughs> yeah. So no, it's a great material to work with. Should we move into what we're putting into the spotlight for this week? Let's do it. Awesome. Um, Brian, do you want to kick it off this week? Well, I am honored. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> of course. So my into the spotlight for this week isn't as interesting as miniatures, but <laughs> it does deal with like elements of design and what design means and how we, what design just means to us. So there's this, uh, in April, when the shutdowns were still going on, still going on, I've watched this really great documentary called Design Canada. So it's a documentary that came out in 2018 by Vancouver-based designer Greg Durrell. And it's a documentary that examines the history and the I of iconography in Canada, mainly focusing on the 1960s all the way up until today. So it's an interesting film that examines different types of graphic designers and certain issues that arose to how how Canada's symbols and images change as Canada was developing its national identity in the 20th century, especially with like uh, the 1976 Olympics, Expo 67 and yeah. others. So it, it's, it's a really fascinating story and interviews all of these very talented graphic designers who've made uh, logos and icons that are still have an impact today. And this ranges from everything from the Canadian flag that we have that was adopted in 1965, uh, the Canada word mark icons for the National Film Board, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CBC, CN Rail, Air Canada, even the no-name brand, you know, that's on the yellow boxes everywhere, uh, the Roots logo, the Montreal Expos, the 1976 Olympics, and just so many others. So it really examines how how 
imagery that we sometimes take for granted, especially in a time and an age where we're inundated with it through our computers, through our cell phones, through social media, and, ha- and learned that like how these symbols that we think of old now were back then were so forward thinking of where they wanted the country to go and how Canada wanted to be presented on the world stage and even within Canada itself. So really, really interesting documentary, a great piece of Canadian content that I really recommend for everyone to check out. That sounds awesome. That reminds me of um, Helvetica, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, so um, if you like that, you would definitely enjoy this. How do you? How did you watch it? Is it on Netflix or? I watched this. Well, I'm, uh, I'm. I can be very uh, forward, forward thinking with like the way I watch things through so streaming services, like everyone else does. Or I watched this on the television channel way back when, if people oh, still wow. know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but no, you can watch this. You can rent it through Amazon Prime. I think you can rent it through uh, iTunes or Apple TV Plus or whatever they call it now. Um, yeah, it's all on on the digital platforms. But I really recommend for people to check it out. And it's always good to support. Canadian filmmakers because you know unfortunately it's harder for Canadian filmmakers to get their just their films and their documentaries out there so yes it's it's I I can promise you it's really worth it if you're interested in the subject matter it's one of the better documentaries I've seen in a long time that's awesome especially as like an American living in Canada like I've it's funny (laughs) I'm always curious to know like how Canadians like what are their brands and logos that are just like yeah that's just the that's the tuna brand that's the mayonnaise brand (laughs) like like, and i just i don't have a sense of like how quintessential things are or if it's just like a regional thing especially what moving from quebec to ontario because you have a good amount of like brand differences in those two places yeah well like when i moved first moved to ontario i told everyone that was moving to canada for the first time in my life (laughs) <laughs> it's a good joke. I got, got a few people to laugh at it, but but no, it's really interesting, especially how it's able to dissect um, Canada's history and identity through something like graphic design is so interesting and how a lot of the push and pull regarding, you know, the creative differences, especially regarding, you know, national symbols and how it ends up to what to where we are now, especially how they're designing the new Canadian flag back in the 60s and they had hundreds of proposals and how they were able to nail it down to the flag that it's so iconic that we that we know today cool um roxanne i'll let you go um next because mine is kind of out of left field if you want to go <laughs> um sure i just wanted to um I, I a friend of mine um she's a great artist she, she's quite wonderful um her name is christine tatillon um she's originally from france but she's been living in um toronto uh for the last uh, 10 years or so um, she's a designer and illustrator, and um, she's been working a lot with uh, sustainable design. And she's also part of the Design TO um, window exhibit um, coming up uh, next week. So, um, yeah, Christine Tatalon, um, her Instagram handle, I think, is uh, CA um, Art Studio. Cool. I just found her on Instagram. That is, she does like really interesting, unique stuff. She does. She does. And I'm hoping to work with her actually, um, with the miniatures. She actually does really nice miniatures also. I, I kind of, um, persuaded her over to the miniature side so, <laughs> hoping to work with her some more. That's so cool. Awesome. Um, I will link that in the show notes, um, along with everything else. All awesome. right. Um, my Into the Spotlight, spotlight is a little fun this week because I feel like a lot of people need a distraction and this cannot be any more distracting from the current state of things. Um, it is a story by David Foster Wallace and it's called A Supposedly Fun Thing I'll Never Do Again. And it's, a, it's actually the title, so the title story of a book of short stories. But this is about, it's a true story of um, he got paid by some magazine to go on a cruise and write about his experience on the cruise and um in like david foster wallace fashion he just like rips it apart um it's just like great comment on just like the ridiculous luxury that is a modern day mega cruise ship he had never been on one before and um it like I've never really been interested in going on a cruise, but this story kind of made me want to go on one just to like experience the ridiculousness of it. Um, 
it's it's just like really fun and really interesting and really great writing um the the larger book itself is also really cool because it has some great stories um there's one about like his tennis escapades as a kid um and a, and a few others yeah it's it's great it's like a hundred page page turner um he has some like half page footnotes <laughs> um it's really fun but i will link that in the show notes as well sweet all right well roxanne thank you so much for coming on um i'm excited to see like all the stuff you have next and um like how your miniatures and life-size work continues to evolve <laughs> thank you thank you so much thanks for having me you're very welcome very looking i'm really looking forward to seeing your future work as well thank you all right have a good day bye you. all right take care guys bye bye